I'd like to welcome everyone here this morning. We're, uh, I'm glad that all of you came out. It's been two weeks since we've been at this because we were interrupted last weekend uh, by the Bible Conference. Uh, a couple things just real quick with respect to the Bible Conference. Uh, Dave Reed and I are in the, in the process of re-editing some of the notes. Um, and so when that's finished, we're going to have Bible Doctrines actually print uh, a new set of notes. Um, we're getting rid of some of the uh, mistakes that were made specifically in uh, lesson six um, that we didn't the original lesson six that we didn't necessarily like so anyway uh, I'm not gonna get get sort of bogged down on that lesson 112 Carl Henry's uneasy conscience um, let me just get right into this with you with the notes and it kind of explain you why we're doing this in lesson 101 we began looking at the new evangelical movement in the United States after World War II we discuss the historical meaning and usage uh, behind the terms evangelical, fundamentalism or fundamental, you could say either one there, and neo-evangelical. So we, we sort of looked at what those terms meant by looking at some history going all the way back to uh, about the just after the Civil War and following that through to after World War II and some of the things that were happening in the 50s, 1950s and 60s. Uh, we further noted how Carl F. Henry, F. H. Henry's book, The Uneasy Conscience of Modern Fundamentalism in 1947, along with the formation of Fuller Theological Seminary, sounded an alarm that fundamentalism needed to change. In order to better understand the origins of the neo-evangelical mindset, the Grace History Project has deemed it necessary to consider some of the specific questions Henry raised in his book. Please recall that the reason we are spending time studying the neo-evangelical movement is to better understand what happened in the grace movement in the late 1960s and early 1970s. My point in doing this is not simply so you know about Carl F. Henry, although that may be worth knowing in and of itself. My bigger point in doing this is so that you can understand and see the ideas that are being put out by this uh, new generation of quote evangelicals and because then we're going to, I'm going to show you how these things come back up within the context of the grace movement in the late 1960s. So there's a sort of a, a bigger purpose for why we're, we're doing what we're doing. So what I've done here is I've just taken Carl Henry's book and just sort of uh, pulled out of it uh, chapter by chapter the main arguments that he's seeking to make uh, so you can have a, a better understanding of, of what uh, him and his uh, peers were sort of um, looking at in terms of problems within fundamentalism at the time. So chapter one, the evaporation of fundamentalist humanitarianism. <coughs> in chapter one, Henry takes aim at what he calls a lack of humanitarianism within fundamentalism. Quote, Against Protestant fundamentalism, the non-evangelicals level the charge that it has no social program, calling for a practical attack on acknowledged world evils. What is almost wholly unintelligible to the naturalistic and idealistic groups, burdened as they are for a new world order, is the apparent lack of any social passion in Protestant fundamentalism. On this evaluation, fundamentalism is the modern priest and Levite bypassing suffering humanity. So there he's sort of making a reference to the uh, parable of Good Samaritan. Okay? The picture is clear when one brings into focus such admitted social evils as aggressive warfare, racial hatred and intolerance, the liquor traffic, and exploitation of labor or management, whichever it may be. The social reform movement dedicated to the elimination of such evils does not have the active, let alone vigorous cooperation of large segments of evangelical Christianity. In fact, fundamentalist churches increasingly have repudiated the very movements whose most energetic efforts have gone into an attack on such social ills. The studies, the studies fundamentalist avoidance of and bitter criticism of the World Council of Churches and Federal Council of, of Churches of Christ in America is a pertinent example. Now such resistance would be far more intelligible to non-evangelicals were it accompanied by an equally forceful assault on social evils in a distinctly supernaturalistic framework. But, by and large, the fundamentalist opposition to social ills has been more vocal than actual. So I don't think I really need to explain to you what he's saying. What he's essentially saying is that 
fundamentalism has no social conscience and that it, it, is, it is saying nothing, doing nothing to address the quote social ills of society. And then he lists a few of them there halfway through that passage that I quoted. Um, he speaks about uh, aggressive warfare. Well, think about the timing of this. It's 1947, World War II has just ended. Uh, you think about the uh, willful strategic bombing of uh, citizen population by virtually every player that took place in World War II. He probably has in mind possibly even the use of the, uh, the atomic weapons against Japan. So he cites aggressive warfare, racial hatred and intolerance, liquor traffic, and exploitation of labor or management, whichever it may be. And what he's saying is the fundamental church, Protestant churches in the United States had completely had nothing to say about those things and had divorced themselves from it. And if they had anything to say about it, they were just giving sort of a lip service to it. And so as you, as you see as we go through here, what he's going to be doing is basically calling upon um, conservative church people in the United States to get involved in aggressive uh, social programs to try to address these social evils. Um, as anecdotal evidence, I'm on the next point now, Henry cites a message he delivered to over 100 evangelical pastors in which he asked, Quote, how many of you during the past six months have preached a sermon devoted in large part to the condemnation of such social evils as aggressive warfare, racial hatred and intolerance, the liquor traffic, exploitation of labor or management, or the like, to which not one pastor, Henry reports, responded in the affirmative. Henry calls this reluctance to come to grips with social evils as a predominant trait in most fundamentalist preaching. So, if you're seeking to understand his uneasy conscience, the title of his book, point number one is clearly what he perceives to be a lack of social concern for these types of uh, social problems affecting um, the, not only the United States, but the world. Henry argues that fundamentalists were hard on individual sin, while at the same time being soft on social evils. Quote, but from the standpoint, not of a few religious modernists, ethical idealists, and humanists, the common strand that runs through fundamentalism and pessimism is that both are viewpoints for which the, the humanism or humanitarianism has evaporated. This is not to suggest that fundamentalism was not militant, it has no militant opposition to sin. Of all modern viewpoints, fundamentalism provided the most realistic appraisal of the condition of man, the sinfulness of man and the exceeding sinfulness of sin, and that God alone can save man from his disaster, uh, were heard with commonplace frequency only within evangelical churches. But the sin against which fundamentalism has in vain almost exclusively was individual sin rather than social evil. So he's, I, he's saying that fundamentalism has a great history of preaching and accurately identifying the sinfulness of man and that the cross work of Christ and so forth is the only answer to sin, but they've had nothing to say about this social uh, situation. So I'm going to finish this point and then see if there's any comment on chapter 1. After discussing the varying personal ethical codes within fundamentalism, Henry concludes chapter 1 by stating. Now, I want to just say a word about this. The examples that he use, uses are he talks about the differences between northern fundamentalists on, say, the, an issue such as smoking and the southern fundamentalists coming from the tobacco belt on their viewpoints on, a, on an issue such as smoking. And what he's saying is that regionally, even within fundamentalism, the northern fundamentalists took a different stance on that issue than the southern fundamentalists that were from the tobacco belt. And so he's, he's looking at differences within fundamentalist opinion about issues like that and citing them as varying personal ethical codes even within fundamentalism. Um, and then he says, finally in chapter 1, quoting the last section now, the failure of the evangelical movement to react favorably on any widespread front to campaigns against social evils has led finally to a suspicion on the part of non-evangelicals that there is something 
in the very nature of fundamentalism which makes a world ethical view impossible. The conviction is widespread that fundamentalism, fundamentalism, fundamentalism takes too pessimistic a view of human nature to make a social program practicable. This modern mindset insisting that evangelical supernaturalism has inherent within it an ideological fault which precludes any vital social trust is one of the most disturbing dividing lines in contemporary thought. In the struggle for a world mind, now that's going to come up again, which will make global order and brotherhood a possibility, contemporary speculation has no hearing whatever for a viewpoint which it suspects has no world program. It dismisses fundamentalism with the thought that in this great expression of the great tradition, the humanitarianism has evaporated from Christianity. So, I think Carl Henry is pretty clear about what he's, uh, you know, what this first point is in chapter one. Um, do any of you have any thoughts, comments, or uh, feedback on this, uh, Beverly and then Norm? Was that a pretty accurate? Um, was he pretty accurate in? how people did view a fundamentalist at that time, or was that his viewpoint? I think he's... I, I, don't, I don't think he's fundamentally inaccurate in some of what he's saying, yeah. okay? Um, look, the, the fundamentalists were... A lot of fundamentalists were extremely legalistic. Yeah. You know, you can't play cards, you can't right. go to movies, you can't do this, you can't do that. And his point about them stressing what you know the personal aspects of sin and morality, I think that's overall on the whole a true point to the to what he perceived to be an exclusion of what you know clearly what he's talking about social ethics or justice, if you will. Um, but that doesn't necessarily answer the question of should the church be. To what degree should the church be involved in those things? He is obviously saying that in order for evangelicalism to be relevant to the world mind, it needs to adopt what he considers to be a progressive social uh, position. Yeah, Norm? <coughs> when you consider, you consider what secular humanism says about mankind getting better over time, and that's the goal of you know the things that they try to do, Opposed to what this fellow is saying about uh, fundamentalism in the in the Christian Church, I think about what Bullinger said about uh, about the idea of mankind ever getting better and the fact that it never will. Uh, that's not to excuse that's not to excuse you know a person's view on evil and, and non-evil. But as far as the church as a whole as an organism, I don't know how easy it would be. Uh, except for the individuals that are part of the body to understand the situation and act on it rather than have the whole the whole denomination or, or, or group of churches uh, just say this is what we're going to do and we're going to change the world accordingly because like I said mankind isn't going to be changed so okay. do, you, do you know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah I know what you're saying uh, I was listening uh, so I, I, I take the uh, Robbie Zacharias podcast sometimes on my iPod, and I was listening to him the other day, and he was saying, look, you can talk about all this social stuff, mumbo-jumbo all you want, but until we realize that the world, that a culture is only going to change one regenerated person at a time, the rest of it is pretty much, you know, he, he has sort of, I perceived him to have sort of a negative view of that, understanding that there is going to be no change apart from the redemptive work of Christ working in the heart of somebody to change them individually. Amen. And the collective work of the Holy Spirit working in the body of Christ is what is going to do that, not some sort of, okay, now we're going to have a program that we're going to go out and do this. Yeah. Now, Henry seems to be advocating for some type of a definite methodology, I guess, if you will. Lee? Yes, uh, I didn't get here exactly on time, but and I didn't hear your comments. But uh, Carl Henry, uh, you have to understand this man is anything but a fundamentalist. Uh, Henry is the father of neo-evangelicalism, and uh, just re reading what he just said here, he he takes a very negative view. He's never been 
uh, part of what we would call traditional fundamentals. Yeah, that's why we're, just for your own context, that's why we're looking at him because we're studying right now the uh, origins of the new evangelical movement. Oh, and okay. Henry's book as being the uh, sort of the shot across the bow, as it were, in 1947, that really kind of, that and the founding of Fuller Theological Seminary. Right. But it is true, there's a difference between the northern and southern fundamentals. You get down to southern, down into Kentucky and Tennessee, and it's not uncommon. I've been there when the preacher has to uh, extinguish, extinguish his cigar or spit out a big chug of black uh, tobacco out of his mouth before he <laughs> preaches. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so yeah, don't start. I'm not going to start that. Don't worry. I'm good with cough drops. <laughs> Chad, did you have a make a comment, Mike? Or well, look like you got to remember, fundamentalism was steeped in Schofieldism at the time, and every dispensation ends in a failure. And so this Israel had just become a nation. Well, it, the signs are all for, coming that the rapture is near, and uh, and uh, we, as one fundamentalist put it, we just rearranging the deck chairs on on the Titanic if we get involved in social uh, activity. Yeah. It's not our purpose. One, you, you're, you're right, and one thing that you're going to see as we continue to go through these notes is his comment about pessimism is an under-the-table slap on dispensational theology. Okay? Because Mike's right. The standard traditional understanding of dispensations is that they all end in what? Failure that man is incapable of bringing about anything good and positive on his own, and without the work of God working on man's behalf, man has no hope, no prayer. So when he's talking about pessimism, it's sort of a, and I think I'll, you'll see that real clearly as we go through this. It it, it really is a sort of a, a jab on dispensationalism in general, which Henry does not like. Okay. So chapter 2, the protest against foredoomed failure. In chapter 2, Henry continues his critique of modern fundamentalism's lack of social conscience by discussing the widely held notion that society is working toward total ruin. Quote, an evangelical message vitally related to world conditions is not precluded by New Testament doctrine. Indeed, conservative Protestantism insists only this estimate of sinful man and his need of regeneration is sufficiently realistic to make all pos to make at all possible any securely grounded optimism in world affairs. Evangelicalism is disturbed. There is a growing awareness in fundamentalist circles that despite the orthodox insistence upon revelation and redemption, evangelical Christianity has become increasingly inarticulate about the social reference of the gospel. The conviction mounts when the relationship of the church to the, to the world conditions must be reappraised, even if the doctrinal limits are regarded as fixed within which solution is likely to be found. While the modern mind, there it is again, wrestles with the global dilemma, the evangelical conscience is troubled because the historic Christian message is dismissed arbitrarily as a dead option for dissolving the ills of us, us, Occidental. Occidental culture. Fundamentalism is wondering just how it is that a world-changing message narrowed in its scope to changing uh, to the changing of isolated individuals. Hey, look, it's it's pretty clear what he's saying here. Reading between the lines, it becomes apparent. Uh, that chapter 2 is largely an attack on the underlying assumptions of dispensational theology. Henry is critical of the pessimism of a society embedded uh, with, with premillenarian understanding of Scripture. Quote, I should, I should be emphasized uh, that this despair over the present world order grows for contemporary fundamentalism is not... Uh, sorry, not out of any lack of confidence in the ability of the supernaturalistic gospel. Rather, issues from the fact that scriptures, as interpreted by premillenarians and amillenarians, hold forth no hope for the conversion of the whole world and center upon the second coming of Christ as crucial for the uh, in, in, introduction of a divine kingdom. 
The despair over the present age, then, is grounded in the anticipated lack of response to the redemptive gospel rather than any inherent defect in the message itself. Fundamentalism is, is revolting against the social gospel. Fundamentalism in revolting against the social gospel seemed also to revolt against the Christian social imperative. So he's saying, look, this fundamentalist, this premillenarian idea that everything's going to go into everything's going to hell in a handbasket, and if not but for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ back to earth to make things right, um, it's, it's, it's fostering and breeding this fundamental underlying pessimism. And it, is it has caused fundamentalism to revolt against what he calls it in that last uh, sentence there, the Christian social imperative. In short, according to Henry, fundamentalism offered no vision for society on par with Augustine's The City of God. So, any uh, thoughts or comments about chapter 2? Yeah? Um, that, that one word he uses at the end there, uh, where'd it go? Uh, revolting, uh, the Christian social imperative, um, the reinterpretation under premillennialism of Matthew 28, um, because the way the way it was word the way it's worded Matthew 28 it says uh, to teach all nations, okay, and and prior to um, understanding the dispensational. Uh, meaning of things like that, it, 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 it could be taken by Christianity that they were to redeem the world by teaching them to observe everything that Christ said. And when we began to realize that we aren't going to succeed at that either, and we need to wait for Christ to return for that to be something that's even possible, um, then it is like it's hopeless, you know. Everybody just needs to wait for Christ to return. I see, I, I see what you I see your point. I mean, there's a there there. He's right in the sense that premillenarianism is saying that the only hope for humanity is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. That is that is a definite tenet of premillenarian teaching. But he, what, what I, I, I see him being critical of that, but I, on the flip side, I see him offering no, no, quote, solution to what he perceives to be the problem. He's, he's identifying here a lot of what he thinks are problems, and even suggesting that some of the doctrine and teaching ought to be changed, but he's not, he's stopping short of offering any, any, any quote, solution to what he perceives the problems to be. Yeah. Well, I think it's because there really isn't a New Testament solution to it that, that we need to get it right. Um, but that's what I think. I, when I was working at the Methodist Church, there's a young man there who's thoroughly Methodist who went to Israel as a missionary uh, between Palestine and Israel. And he's over there really beating his head against a brick wall trying to figure out why he can't get these two sides to, you know, talk to each other civilly and and make nice, you know, and, and so I just briefly commented to him in a Facebook message that I just don't think that's ever going to happen until, there's not going to be peace over there until Christ returns, and he, um, you know, he just could not accept that as, in, as even being a biblically grounded point of view, just because they, uh, the Methodists have, are not premillennial, and they have a, um, a different worldview, I guess. And, and certainly, just one other point, if you look at halfway down page 3, when he's talking about the scriptures as interpreted by premillennarians and amillennarians, within fundamentalism, the vast majority of them were premillennial, not amillennial. And as Mike already pointed out, a lot of that is due to the influence of the Schofield Reference Bible. So chapter 3, the most embarrassing evangelical divorce. Chapter 3 opens with the following statements. For the, for the first protracted period in history, evangelical Christianity stands divorced from the great social reform movements. As a consequence, Protestant evangelicalism, without a world program, has largely relegated itself to a secondary or even more subordinate role 
of changing the prevailing cultural mood. So again, his focus is on this world mind, this cultural mood, this societal um, social program and so forth. Okay? Henry viewed contemporary fundamentalism as having lost its biblical imperative to affect the culture. Quote, for fundamentalism in the main falls to fail, sorry, to make relevant to the great moral programs in the 20th century, global living, the implications of this redemptive message. Hebrew Christian thought historically has stood as a closely knit world and life view. Metaphysics and ethics went everywhere together in biblical intent. The great doctrines implied a divinely related social order with intimation for all humanity. The ideal Hebrew and Christian society throbbed with challenge to the predominant culture of this generation, condemning with redemptive might the tolerated social evils for the redemptive message was to light the world and salt the earth. So, I think what he's getting at here and is, you know, he'll look at, say, the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ while he's on earth and him challenging the um, religious leadership of the nation of Israel on their, you know, um, and, 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 and trying to shake up the, the order there within Israel and so forth, and that that, that um, mode of operation was to follow the, the, the teachings of Jesus, you know, uh, throughout, the, throughout church history. And so when he says here, uh, the, the one line specifically, um, when he says at the bottom of page 3, the great doctrines, the great doctrines impale a divinely related social order with intimation for all humanity, the ideal Hebrew and Christian society throbbed with challenge to the predominant culture of this generation, condemning with redemptive might the tolerated social evils. It's pretty clear to me that, again, his focus here is on what he perceives to be these social concerns. Okay? Yeah. But he, I don't think he's even right in how he's looking at it if you just take the teachings of Christ because Jesus condemned individual Pharisees and Sadducees for not individually helping an individual fellow human being and not having compassion. He didn't. He, Jesus never preached against the, the whole way that their religion was organized or that they were separatistic in... Um, in general, you know. But he, he, he does tell them to honor those that sit in Moses' seat. Yeah. He is critical of their Phariseeism, if you will, their say, you know, do as I say, not as I do uh, actions and, and mentality. But and what Henry is saying is look, this is we need to be if we if we are not functioning as believers with this sort of social conscience, if you will, this humanitarian Christian humanitarianism, then we've left part of what he perceives to be the redemptive gospel. Okay? Henry concludes the chapter by criticizing Protestant fundamentalism for deserting the social imperative of the Christian gospel. Quote, Today Protestant fundamentalism, although heir apparent to the supernaturalistic gospel of the biblical and reformation minds, is a stranger and its predominant spirit to the vigorous social interest of its ideological forebears. Modern fundamentalism does not explicitly sketch the social implications of its message for the non-Christian world. It does not challenge the injustices of the totalitarianisms, the secularism of modern education, the evils of racial hatred, the wrong, uh, the wrong of current labor management relations, the inadequate basis of internal and international dealings. It has ceased to challenge Caesar and Rome as though in uh, feudal resignation and submission to the triumphant Renaissance mood. Well, okay. The apostolic gospel stands divorced from a, notice, from a passion to right the world. The Christian social imperative today is in the hands of those who understand it in sub-Christian terms. So, again, I think it's pretty clear what he's getting at here. Fred? Basically, what he's saying is that he's got the post millennium view and that you have to bring in the, the kingdom through
through changing the world, and you're going to change the world through social gospel. You know, uh, that's what it seems to sound like to me. But I think that he would argue that he. I think he would. I, th I think he's saying that without saying that. You know, that's what like, it sounds to me like. Well, that's what it sounds like to me too. But I think if you were to stand him in front of you and ask him, right, "This is what you're saying," he'd say, "Oh no, that's not what I'm saying." So there, you know, again, maybe I'm misunderstanding it, but I, I perceive there to be a little bit of uh, finagling here. Yeah. Well, I keep going. Well, why was anyone insulted by him telling us that this is what we believe? That's how I feel. I'm like, yeah, that's what's biblical. Anytime somebody stands up and starts throwing darts at your balloons, you probably don't really like it so much. And I, I don't want you to—I don't want to put out the idea that there wasn't a big backlash against these guys because there was. Okay, these guys were not. They, these guys were not just accepted. In, this, this thinking was not just accepted into everybody's framework without um, significant revolt against it in certain, in, in, you know, in many cases, in fact. And again, I can't stress this enough. When we get to the 60s, this stuff right here is part of... Mike's read that article, The Spirit, the Spirit of Bereanism, by uh, Weddle in, from 1966. It, is, it sounds very much like what Carl F. Henry is talking about here in 1947. And so the underlying source of tension that led to Stan breaking away from the GGF and having his controversy with Grace Bible College is over this stuff right here. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I'm spending time having you understand now what these guys were teaching. So when we get to the 60s in a few weeks, you'll have a framework of understanding to, to, to properly know and, and, and frame the discussion about what happened in the Grace Movement in the 1960s. That also is uh, the birth, of, that thought is the birth of when I were in, we were in Bible college, was uh, that uh, book of uh, cooperative evangelism. Uh, Stam also that book on the controversy. Although I noticed they retitled it, his book on the controversy is exactly a reaction to this stuff of neo evangelicalism. And we're going to talk more about that as well. Yeah. Um, I don't. My personal opinion, Lee, and this is just my own reading of uh, the controversy. I see him reacting more in that book against what he viewed as the opponents of the opponents of mid-ex Pauline dispensationalism, and I think his reaction against new evangelicalism comes in the 60s, the later 60s, because Stan writes a book in 1968 called This Present Peril, yeah. and it, the subtitle on that is something about new evangelicalism, okay? That same year is the year that Stan leaves the GGF, okay? So the years between 1966 and 1968 are the, are the, the real years of controversy as far as uh, controversy between Pastor Stam and the GGF and, the G, and, and Grace Bible College. But all of that controversy has its backdrop in this new evangelical discussion, okay? Pastor Brian? Yeah. This is a social ill that, that happened in the late 60s was the hippie movement, which were individuals rebelling against that strict, a lot of those were raised in Christian homes, they were rebelling against that strictness that they were raised under with no movies and all that, and, and, but their focus in voice was against social ills, against um, uh, the establishment at the time, you know, of what they saw was causing a lot of the problems too. And so, you know, um, they said they were out for social ills and we know what happened with the hippie movement it tended up being into more personal satisfaction in different ways and sell drugs and, and uh, the sex that came along with that, but, and the music. And so, um, I don't know if that was a part of um, if that would be tied in with what was happening and if that affected the church at the time or not. Well, I think it, it certainly did. And when you look at the, lit the literature uh, from the late 60s, um, there was another uh, article that made a bunch of people mad by a guy named Erickson. 
who wrote an article in the uh, Grace Journal of Theology advocating the reading of certain books, novels, that, it's, that you know, I haven't sat and read the novels, but apparently some people objected to them because of some of their, what they perceived to be gratuitous content. And here's a guy saying you should read this book, and oh, you know, that's like, that's like an anathema for Stan, for somebody to be saying that, and, and they're trying to justify it. You, you see in the literature then a, a justification, well, you know, we need to, if we're going to be in tune with the culture, we need to be aware of these things, we need to be aware of this and that. And so there's a, there's a tension there that goes back to what's going on here, okay? But we need to move on if we're going to come close to finishing this. Chapter 4, The Apprehension Over Kingdom Preaching. Chapter 4 contains Henry's strongest anti-dispensational comments. On page 52 he writes, The writer's own convictions, while broadly premillennial, are not partial to the dispensational postponement theory of the kingdom. This is not a necessary adjunct of a premillennial view. It appears more in accord with the biblical, prop, biblical philosophy of history to think of the church age in terms of a divine continui continuity rather than a parenthesis, in terms of an amazing unity of the redemptive plan rather than in terms of an amazing interlude. Hey, that right there is the birthplace of progressive dispensationalism. Okay? Very important statement. That's a very important statement. When he says this, he is what he's trying to do is find commonality here and say, yeah, I'm premillennial, but I don't think that the current dispensation is a postponement of the prophetic plan of God as part of a divine continu continuum. Which I think we understand, if you understand that the twofold purpose of God that he has a plan for the heaven and a plan for the earth and so forth, and you understand the dispensation of grace as dealing with the church, the body of Christ, that's going to populate the heavenly places and so forth in eternity, yes, there is a singular plan that's something God is trying to, to uh, accomplish, but that's not what Henry means in these comments. Okay? Um, just one second, Mike, let me finish this section and then I'll uh, uh, take your comment. Uh, when Henry concedes that the prophecies demand a future earthly fulfillment, he does not limit his conceptualization of the kingdom to a future literal fulfillment. Rather, Henry sees aspects of God's kingdom at work in the world now. No study of the kingdom teaching of Jesus is adequate unless it recognizes his implication both that the kingdom is here and that it is not here. This does not imply an ultimate paradox, but rather stresses that the kingdom exists in incomplete realization. The task of the Bible student is to discover, one, in what sense is it here, two, in what sense will it be further realized before the advent of Christ, and three, in what sense will it be fully realized at the advent of Christ. The extent to which man centers his life and energy in the redemptive king now determines the extent of the divine kingdom in the present age. The kingdom is not to be totally identified with an earthly rule, though some have. The kingdom is not wholly future. Paul writes to the Romans that the kingdom of God means righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. These passages, and then he quotes from uh, the, the references that I listed there, these passages, among others, argue clearly that the kingdom is a present spiritual reality in, in the lives of believers being coexistent with the outworked, redemptive, and regenerative plan of God. So that's a mouthful, and you're probably going to have to take some time to digest what he's saying there. But again, this is a, this is a um, standard supposition of progressive dispensationalism that, he is, uh, that he's making known here before there was such a term. Henry reports how he was cautioned by a fundamentalist preacher to stay away from the topic of the kingdom. Because, uh, because, quote, there's growing reluctance to explicate the kingdom idea in fundamentalist preaching because a kingdom now message is too easily confused with the literal social gospel and because a kingdom then message will identify Christianity further to the modern mind in terms of an escape mechanism. Chapter 4 ends with Henry offering contemporary evangelism four suggestions. Number one, Reawaken the relevance of this redemptive message to the global predicament. 
Number two, stress the great evangelical agreements in the common in the common world front. Some of this stuff I don't even know what he means. Three, discard elements of its message with cut, which cut the nerve of world compassion as contradictory to the inherent genu uh, genuineness of Christian genius. Sorry, Christianity. And four, restudy eschatological convictions for a proper perspective, which with, with which not unnecessarily. Uh, dissipate evangelical strength in con in controversy over secondary positions. Secondary positions. You know what he's referring to? The rapture of the church. He views that as the whole discussion about when the rapture occurs, he views that as a completely useless discussion that is just clouding the issue. Okay? It could be it could be deduced from page 50 that Henry considered disagreements over the timing of the rapture secondary discussions, should say discussions, that should be discarded. Okay? All right. Real quick, thoughts, questions, comments about chapter 4. You should be getting a general flavor here of what he's, what he's getting at by now. Chapter that, that controversy runs much deeper than just Carl Henry. You have uh, the consequence of that in Fuller Seminary. Uh, Harold Linzel, Dr. Linzel was a part with Henry here, and finally Henry, uh, Linzel says, uh, I don't want to be called, don't call me an evangelical. He said uh, it's about as meaningless as a label on an empty bottle. So I do think that there was, uh, Henry was certainly, was one of the major people who sowed these seeds from the standpoint of uh, an intellectual academic viewpoint. Yeah, of course. And I think we still see uh, the, the seeds of it. For example, ask where is Fuller, Se Fuller Seminary today in terms of preaching the gospel. We were just talking about that. The last study two weeks ago before the conference, we spent some time talking about Fuller Seminary. And uh, Mike and I have been discussing uh, Linsdell and his... Um, Expose on the inerrancy subject at uh, at uh, Fuller Theological Seminary. The battle for the Bible, the yeah. Bible and the balance. So there, there's okay. there, there's stuff going on here, but um, again, these things have greater implications beyond just these writings. They have implications even within the Grace Movement. Sure do, Mike. You can see how subtle how subtle it becomes when you compare the new Schofield Bible with the old Schofield Bible. You go yes. to the Sermon on the Mount. You'll see all of a sudden now there's a, got a twofold application to the Sermon on the Mount. It's for the church. It also has a millennial application, but it also has a church ecclesiastical application for us today. And while the old school field Bible did not make that distinction at all. Uh, yep, and that's, uh, that's just one example. The new school field Bible, we're going to talk about that as well oh. eventually. Yeah, that's a good comment. Chapter 5, The Fundamentalist Thief on the Cross. And eventually I may just have to skip to the end here, so we'll just see how this goes. Um, uh, quoting now from chapter 5, The two thieves between whom Jesus was crucified might without too wild an imagination bear the labels of humanism and fundamentalism. Are the opening lines from chapter 5. So without too wild of imagination, you can call the one thief fundamentalism and the other thief humanism. Okay, well, the bulk of chapter 5 deals with the pharisaical spirit of fundamentalism that turns inessentials into essentials. Quote, the time has come for fundamentalism to speak with an ecumenical outlook and voice. If it speaks in terms of the historic tradition rather than in the name of secondary assertions or of eschatological biases on which evangelicals divide, it can refashion the modern mind. There it is again. Okay? Notice, so he's when he's talking here about evangel eschatological biases of which evangelicals divide, in my opinion, he's clearly referring to the rapture question as part of this, he's, this thing. He's a historic pre-mill, and they yeah. say his hate dispensationalism. But a double, but a double-minded fundamentalism which veers between essentials and inessentials will receive little of the Lord and not much of a hearing from the perishing multitudes. Henry quotes 
the word of Dr. William Ward Ayer uh, regarding Pharisaical fundamentalism. Dr. Ayer deplores the Pharisaical spirit of fundamentalism and he warns that unless there is a resurgence of love and a breadth of mind and spirit in our midst, we shall more effectively deny the faith uh, than, the, than the religiously shallow modernists can ever do. Their following is limited, ours is large. Toward the end of, end of the chapter, Henry sums up fundamentalism's, fundamentalism problems as follows, quote, If Protestant orthodoxy holds itself aloof to the present world predicament, it is doomed to a much reduced role. In the previous crisis of culture, whether the challenge of the Greco-Roman world in the apost apostolic age or the challenge of corrupt medieval Catholicism in the Reformation movement, orthodoxy led the battle led the battle for new order and was not content with a secondary or tertiary role. If the evangelical answer it is in terms of religious escapism, then the salt has lost its savor. Again, it's pretty clear what he's getting at here. So, just try to move on to, to, to finish the next two pages. Chapter 6, The Struggle... For, now, look at the title of this chapter. Chapter 6 is titled, The Struggle for a New World Mind. Okay? In this chapter, Henry argues that if historic Christianity is going to survive, it must project solutions to world problems. Quote, If historic Christianity is again to compete as a vital world ideology, Evangelicalism must project a solution for the most pressing world problems. It must offer a formula for a new world mind with spiritual ends, involving evangelical affirmations in political, economic, sociological, and education realms, uh, local and international. The redemptive message has implications for all life. A truncated, a truncated life results from a truncated message. Henry argues that even if this redemptive message cannot create a full Christian civilization, that it should not stop evangelicals from Christianizing as many areas as possible. Quote, that evangelical. Now, it seems to me that he's sort of admitting that it's not possible, but anyway, we'll take any comments on that when I'm done with the section. That evangelicalism may not create a fully Christian civilization does not argue against an effort to win as many areas as possible by the redemptive power of Christ. It can engender reformation here and overthrow paganism there. It can win outlets for the redemption that is in Christ Jesus reminiscent of apostolic triumphs. If Christianity can bring new life to Russia, there is no argument for it not bringing it to China. If it, if it cannot bring reformation to Spain, there is no reason for not, it not bringing reformation to South America. In order, for evangelical, in order for evangelicalism to create this, quote, new world mind, Henry advocates for a new ordering of the education system. Quote, evangelicalism will have to contend for a new order in education. The Western concept of popular education has its legitimate rootage in the determination of the church to indoctrinate the masses in the, in the major doctrinal essentials of the Christian world life view. For the past three centuries, the state has steadily supplanted the church as the indoctrinating agency. And today, secular education largely involves an open or subtle undermining of historic Christian theism. That's obviously true. Okay, Evangelicalism must contend under such circumstances for two great academic changes. First, it must develop a competent literature in every field of study on every level from the grade school through the university which adequately presents each subject with its implications for the Christian as well as non-Christian points of view. Second, evangelicalism must not let the fact that the state has now become an agent of indoctrination obscure the evangelical obligation to press the Christian world life view upon the masses. Okay, so last page now, and then we'll just, I'll just finish this up, and then we'll probably have about five minutes if there's any questions or comments, because page eight is just the, 
works cited page. Chapter 7, The Evangelical Formula of Protest. As the title suggests, the bulk of this chapter is taken up with presenting an evangelical formula for advancing their agenda. Quote, this creates the most favorable opportunity evangelicalism has had since its embarrassing divorce from the world social program to recapture its right leadership and pressing for a new world order. Therefore, the path of evangelical action seems to be an eagerness to condemn all social evils no less vigorously than any other group, and a determination, number one, when evangelicals are in the majority, to couple such condemnation with the redemptive Christian message as the only true solution. Number two, when evangelicals are in the minority, to express their opposition to the, e to the evils in a formula of protest, concurring heartily in the assault on social wrongs, but insisting upon the regenerative context as alone able to secure the permanent um, rectification. rectification of such wrongs. Thus evangelicals will take their stand against evil and against it in the name of Jesus Christ the Deliverer, both within their own groups and within other groups. To do this is to recapture the evangelical spirit. And last chapter, chapter 8, the dawn of a new reformation. In the final chapter of his book, Henry calls for a new reformation within evangelicalism with ecumenical significance. And he says, the, uh, quote, the cries of suffering humanity today are many. No evangelicalism which ignores the totality of man's condition dare respond in the name of Christianity. Though the modern crisis is not, is not basically political, economic, or social, fundamentally it is religious, yet evangelism, evangelicalism must be armed to declare the implications of this proposed religious solution for the political, politico, economic, and sociological context for modern life. And two points left. The battle against evil in all forms must be pressed unsparingly. We must pursue the enemy in politics and economics and science and ethics everywhere in every field. We must pursue relentlessly. But when we have singled out the enemy, when we have disentang disentangled him from those whose company he has kept and whom he, ha and whom he has misled, we must, we must meet the foe head on, girt in the gospel armor. The evangelical task primarily is the preaching of the gospel in the interest of, even, of individual regeneration by the su supernatural grace of God, in such a way that divine redemption can be recognized the best solution of our problems, individual and social. This produces within history, through the redemptive work of the Holy Spirit, a divine society that transcends nations and international lines. So, there you have a summary of Carl Henry's uneasy conscience and some of the things that he viewed as problems. Beverly? Is that the pretty much the birthplace of uh, social evangelism then, as it's been popular through the churches today? I don't know. I personally don't know enough about the history of social evangelism to say, but I certainly think that his comments there didn't hurt. They didn't hurt those that had those types of thoughts. Okay. Norm, your hand up? I just look at the back of when he says, he's, he uses the word we an awful lot. And you think about the word we, and then you think about when do we ever, dis, when do we ever agree with each other, okay? So he's, who, who's going to formulate what he's talking about here? Is it going to be a group of men? Is it going to be two men saying, everybody else go out and do this? Or is he looking at the word? I don't really think so. It's going it, to be a group of Christian intellectuals yeah. that are going to do this. Okay, and Fuller Theological Seminary, founded in the same year this book was printed, with him as a faculty member, goes out with the intent of doing that. Okay? Um, and so you look at, for example, you know, like uh, uh, Mike and I were talking a few weeks back about George Ladd, George Eldon Ladd's uh, writings. He's trying to 
downplayed the, the, the uh, distinctions between uh, Israel and the church and trying to find all these commonalities and so forth between uh, the nation of Israel and the church, the body of Christ. And it's very similar thinking to what, what Henry says when he's talking about uh, not viewing the, the, the present age as a parenthesis, as, as, a, as, a new, as a new previously unrevealed thing, but as a continuation of this this kingdom ethic, if you will, that started with the, with you know in the Gospels and so forth, and so they're trying to find all these they're trying to find all these commonalities, and in doing so, what they're really doing is 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 downplaying dispensational theology. And Stam knows this, which is why when Stam sees some of the some of the uh, some um, thinking coming out of the college that is reminiscent of some of these things. He immediately assumes that they've gone what? That they're all neo evangelical now. Okay? So all of that stuff that happened in the 60s and early 70s is all coming out of this mentality. Can I, can I, I say? Okay, Norm and then Lee and then Fred. Where do they think the church has been for 1900 years? I mean, the body of Christ has always existed and been added to. Even when things weren't exactly being taught the way they should have been, there were still people being taken out for 1,900 years. Why do they think it's so important that they change the game plan? Because individuals are, are, are presented to Christ as individuals. It's like cells to the body. Uh, it's not like taking the whole world as a group. It's like one at a time. Do you remember when I taught the lesson on the history of inerrancy? Yeah. I taught two lessons on the history of inerrancy. And I said to you that... When the inerrancy question first came up after uh, in, in the late nineteen in the late nineteenth century, late eighteen hundreds, that the guys at Princeton Theological Seminary took up the discussion on the terms that were being set by their opponents. You remember that? And and, and I, I try to demonstrate to you how what they ended up articulating is a definition of an inerrancy that doesn't really mean anything. So if, if, if my position on inerrancy is that what's inerrant is the original autographs, and nobody has the original autographs, then what good does it do me to argue for the, for the inerrancy of something that everybody acknowledges no longer exists? But they, they, they formulated that position based upon terms that were set by the people they were arguing with. Okay, So rather than... Rather than denying their fundamental premises, they accept their premises, and then, was, then they articulate a position based on what their opponents are criticizing them about. I see, I see a similar thing going on here with Carl Henry, where there's, there's liberal theologians and stuff that are out there that are, that are causing all of a ruckus and you know, throwing darts at fundamentalism, and rather than what he does is he basically accepts a lot of the premises of what these critics have to say and then goes out to articulate this great fundamentalistic reform based upon premises that were set by you know by, by opponents now you know maybe I'm wrong about that maybe I'm maybe that's too simplistic but I, I don't think it's completely out of the realm of accuracy okay Lee uh, 30 years ago I wrote a book called from separation to syncretism and that was largely a critique of Fuller Seminary. Uh, it's interesting to observe that it was Carl Henry, and uh, eventually Fuller uh, uh, systematically targeted the fundamentalists and the dispensationalists. Little by little, they eliminated them. Uh, Wilbur Smith was one of the best read, greatest. He was an Acts II dispensationalist, but they eventually got rid of him. They got rid of Henry, Harry uh, Linzel, uh, Francis Schaeffer, if you've ever read his book called The Great Evangelical Disaster, and he points out the same, and that was his reason for uh, objecting to Carl Henry and what he was believing in the, the new world order, the new mind thing, I, I, that's a key thing to me, but uh, he points that all out. It's interesting too, though, that his own son, Francis Schaeffer's son, bought into this same philosophy in today's a Roman Catholic priest. Yeah. You, you, you've got to see where this stuff leads you to. Uh, and that's my, my biggest comment. I wrote that article in, at Grace Bible College. Man, they were all over me like a duck on a June bug. Uh, yeah, whatever. And, uh, 
I got I got uh, nailed to the wall by uh, Sam Litton and uh, Kemper and uh, Dale DeWitt and uh, Tim Conklin. Man, they nailed my hide to the wall over even mentioning uh, some of the newer philosophy that was coming out of Fordham Seminary and specifically Dr. Henry. And I've never really recovered from that either. <laughs> <laughs> Fred, last comment, then we'll get yeah, quick. Just interesting to me that in the last last paragraph there on the bottom of page seven, it's almost like it comes back around to admitting that. Yeah, I know. I've had that, the same thought. That the uh, real answer is the preaching uh, of the cross to individuals, yeah. and the, yeah. my fundamental frustration with reading this book, Fred, was I. Th there's a lot of questions, a lot of Heavy, highfalutin thinking, but not a lot of solutions yeah. to no. what he thinks are the problems. Yeah, right, right. So, yeah. and I, I agree with your comment there, Fred. So, uh, we're, we're past time, Lee. You, okay. you, you can't. Uh, let's go. Last no, comment. No, no. <laughs> no you're, I just want to make comment about your gospel thing the other day. That was fantastic. Uh, I hope you'll uh, publish all of that. Uh, uh, right now, in dispensationalism, namely Acts 2 dispensationalism, there's a whole argument going on now for the need to preach a Christless or a crossless gospel. Are you familiar with all of that? I'm not. It's unreal. And these people are, I mean, these are people who once stood for, and now the idea is the gospel does not need to emphasize the cross. It's called the crossless gospel. You just have to believe on Jesus. Yeah. yeah. And that's. And that's the big thing in dispensationalism right now. Yeah, interesting. You got, yeah. If you have something to read about that, I'd like to see it. I've got it, yeah. Okay, hey, thanks for your attention. We'll see you next week.